When our house burned down, my family and I lost everything. But this is a Coleco fishing cartridge that we pulled from the ashes. And we're going to see if we can recover it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This channel is sponsored by PCBWay, and they don't just do PCBs. If you want professional 3D printing, just upload your models, pick from a variety of materials and colours, and you're on your PCBWay. Thanks to Elaine and the PCBWay team for supporting Mark Fix's stuff. This ColecoVision cartridge has had better days. As you can see, it's been in a fire. The same fire that claimed all of my earthly belongings and my retro collection. So this cartridge is kind of a symbol of hope to me. Now this probably sounds bonkers, but hear me out. I think that the board inside might actually still be usable. If you can see the edge connector here, it's not actually that damaged. So I was thinking we might be able to crack the whole thing open, clean up the board, and see if we can house it in a new 3D printed shell. First we need to find the screw holes. There's usually two on a CV cartridge and they're handily located underneath the label. I guess that stops tampering. Unfortunately, due to the fire, we can't find the second hole. I'm probably fumbling around in the wrong place, but to be honest, looking at the left-hand side of the cartridge, I think it's kind of a moot point. Let's work with what we've got. Even attempting to unscrew the one exposed screw comes to nothing because unfortunately it just won't come out of the fused shell. So I decide to use a bit of brute force and ignorance, which I have in equal measures. But even that wasn't working. We need another idea. Looking in the side of the cartridge I can see that there's a gap that I can slip a tool into and crack it wide open. Yeah, let's do that. I think we're well beyond the retro preservation stage here. And with the merest of leverage, the case cracks in half. And I'm wondering if I can actually slip the board out from there now. It's actually still quite tightly held by the piece of the case that hasn't cracked away. So we grab our trusty tool again and use that well-tested brute force and ignorance. And like that, the board is free. And I have to say I'm pretty surprised at the condition of the board. This cartridge was near where the fire had started and I was told that at that point the house would have reached nearly 300 degrees. Some items were shielded by the collapsing house and other items that have melted on top of them and this cartridge was one such item. I'm not sure if we'll need this anymore but I'll put it to one side just in case. And despite soot, the board is incredibly well preserved. There's a bit of pitting on the connectors but I think that if this worked before, it'll probably work now. Let's have a clean up. I saved quite a few items from the house even though they look like they would be on repair because I think I just had a terrible time of letting go. I'd been collecting for nearly 25 years when the house fire happened and losing all my collection was devastating. I probably would have given up and just walked away apart from the fact that the fantastic retro community really rallied round and supported me and that's kept me going so thank you so much. Time to start cleaning. And I think that this board is actually more contaminated than it appears. We're going to use some cotton swabs. And I'll be really interested to see just what comes off of this PCB. One thing that I've learned the hard way is that soot is more like a grease than you would imagine. And for that reason, we're going to use some isopropyl alcohol. This will break down the grease and help us remove the soot. Another thing I've learned in my cleaning up adventures is that whilst you would imagine that soot is a surface deposit, the fact that it's deposited on surfaces at around 300 degrees centigrade means that it can embed into almost anything, making it quite difficult to remove. 
That being said, the isopropyl alcohol here is doing a great job of getting the first layer of soot off of these contacts. And would you look at that? One of the other things that I learned fairly quickly from trying to rescue items is you're not just dealing with soot. When your house catches fire, first it burns. The heat inside becomes intense, vaporizing almost everything. Some things may hide and survive, but the smoke is an awful chemical concoction, a cocktail of toxins. And then, if you're lucky, the fire brigade will arrive and put it out. More often than not, they'll use water hoses, which then turns everything into a massive soup. So you have toxins, soot, and then eventually, mold and corrosion. All in all, not a good thing. Let's speed this up. Even with all this cleaning, I can't get everything off of the board. So it's time for some other techniques. There is some surface pitting, but I don't want to resort to metal polish because I can't help thinking that might damage it more. I tried a dry cloth to see if that helped, but everything is rigidly stuck to the surface. It's not moving. So I'm bringing out the secret weapon, Rod Hull's The Future Was 8-Bit Edge Connector Cleaning Tool. In reality, it's kind of like an ink rubber. It's got an abrasive compound inside it, so it's like a very, very mild sandpaper. Results aren't instant, but they are worth the effort that you put in. After a while, you can start to see all of the pitting is lifted. We're not going to get incredibly shiny edge fingers this way, but that's not what we want. What we want is electrically conductive edge fingers. I spent a good few minutes going over these contacts, and when I felt like I could rub no more, it was time to see the fruits of my labor. And it hasn't come out bad at all. The wear on the end of the contacts is through general use. The black marks on the end of the cartridge are soot stains and they won't come off. You can see they've happened where the PCB has been worn down, again through insertion and removal. Other than that, it's looking really good. I'm quite hopeful that this will work, but we can't leave it lying around naked like this. Luckily, and unusually for me, I'd thought ahead, and whilst we're cleaning up the PCB, I'd set about printing a new cartridge shell. You can find a link to this below. Rather ridiculously, I printed it in carbon fibre on the new Creality K1C. And they came out pretty well. Not the best print, but I've not calibrated the printer at all. A bit of stringing, but for functional parts, I think we'll get away with it. And they even fit together. That's a bonus. Great. So back at the workbench, let's look at what we've got. I'm not going to bother cleaning up this stringing because, well, you're not going to see it. There's also some first layer issues, but we won't see those either once we've put our label on, so I'm not particularly worried. But I have to say, dimensional accuracy is spot on. That's not going anywhere. And it feels really cathartic to close this shell. Excellent. This model is amazing. Massive thanks to Jay Stonian who put this on Thingiverse. Now we need some screws. But I'm not sure what size to use. So I think the best thing to do is take the old broken shell and measure the ones that are in that. And they seem to come up a shade under 12 millimeters if I measure the entire screw. And that's probably a couple of mil for the head and the rest for the shaft. Who else has got a screw assortment like this? Carefully organized into compartments and by carefully organized, I mean not at all. You had one job divider, one job. But after rifling through and measuring a few screws, we find a good candidate for our cartridge shell. Let's go for it. Screwing into carbon fiber is a bit tougher than screwing into standard PLA, but let's bear in mind that we're cutting the first thread in our thermoplastic here. At this point, it's more than possible to overdo it and end up cracking your 3D print. So I take it easy and I keep checking along the way. There's still a little way to go. 
and when the screw is finally all the way in, I can feel it. In fact, the print turns. And that's as tight as a duck's derriere. I'm more confident with the second screw, so I go super speedy. And there, ladles and jelly spoons, we have it. But I felt like something was missing. It's a great model, a great print, but it doesn't really celebrate the rising from the ashes that this print does. Yes, it's white. Yes, it looks thin and crap, but it glows in the dark. And who doesn't like things that glow in the dark? Nothing fires up my 80s nostalgia more than glow in the dark things. This STL model is by Fierro Luke, and the link is also below. It's slightly different to the one that I used before, which makes it easier to print. Anyway, that's all housed up. Now we need a label. Over to Photoshop. I started with the size I needed, filled it with black and rounded the corners. Then I made another rectangle, rounded the corners and this rectangle is just so that I can add a white stroke, which you'll recognise as soon as I turn it on. Yep, that's pure ColecoVision cartridge right there. You can see the effect better when I turn on the layer underneath it. I'm not going for a replica label, just something in the style of, sort of a mixture of the original labels. I found some graphics from the Internet Archive. They're not massively high quality, but they'll do. I then found the Carnival logo on a PDF for a flyer of the game. Removing parts I didn't want from the two elements, I then replicated them at the top of the label for the spine and added some text about our project at the bottom of the label. I did revisit the document dimensions to make them match the original labels perfectly, in case anyone found them useful in the future. I then started to print through the god-awful Cricut software. I like to use ice-branded photo sticker paper because it gives me good results. The labels are nice and sticky, and most importantly, the printed image isn't easy to smudge. I won't be using a sealant on these labels because they should be fine as they are and I'm pretty happy with that output. The next part of the process is to put them into the cricket and have them cut out. Nothing signals to the world more quickly that you're a cat owner than the sticky mats that you need to put things through a cricket. Good old Ronnie. To ensure a nice cut, I've decided to change the blade in the cricket first. I've been cutting quite a lot of vinyl and this can blunt the blade and a blunt blade when you're cutting paper will turn up the edges and create a nasty mess. These are just generic blades from Amazon, and they're easy to fit. Just take off the safety cap. Oh, I should have done this after I'd taken this bit out. Anyway, you take out the blade holder, press down on the button on the top, it pops out. Grab it with your exposed fingers, pull that out, pop the new one in. It's magnetic, let go of the button, and jobs are good and pop it back into the holder and close the door. There's also a second tool holder but I've never used that. I think it's for a pen. Now it's time to load the mat holding our labels. Once it's in the right position we just press the feed button. The mat's pulled through the machine and the optical sensor measures the length of the mat. At some point it also measures those black lines which tells it exactly where to cut. It's all very clever. The PC asks us what we'd like to cut and how, and I select photo sticker paper with a kiss cut. A kiss cut means it doesn't go all the way through the backing, which is really, really handy. This is much better than scissors. Some people don't like the Cricut because it's a closed ecosystem, and I'm not keen on that either. The software does nag you a bit to subscribe to their service. It's a hard no from me. You can see the cuts here on the label. It's a good job we put bleed on, otherwise we might have missed the black. And our label is complete. I'm pretty pleased with this. It's time for the tight tuchuses, the stress sphincters, and eh, general nerves, as we try and apply the label and make sure it goes on straight. Like I said earlier, ice photo paper is really sticky. So if you get this wrong, it's very difficult to get it off again but I think we've made a good fist of it. In fact, I'd go as far to say I'm completely over the moon with this result. 
I can't even listen to Bastille's Things We Lost in the Fire without getting sad, so to see this restored it really brings a tear to my eye. But more tears were to come when I realised what terrible condition my ColecoVision console was in. Sure, we're using the original power supply, but that shouldn't be a problem. The plug, however, is so old that it doesn't actually adhere to UK standards anymore. Can you see why? 100 fake internet points, if you correctly guessed, it's because there's no sleeving on the live and neutral pins. This wouldn't pass any kind of test these days. I'll get this changed at the next possible opportunity. I also noticed another issue with the console. If you look back here where the RF cable comes out, and we are using RF today, you'll see that the cable has split with the copper conductors flapping in the wind. It's not dangerous, but it's really not good. The controllers are, frankly, mega manky. I got this from a Facebook post and it had been kept in a shed. I knew that I had a console, but I didn't realize just how dirty it was. In fact, I've forgotten. The ColecoVision that I had before the fire was absolutely mint, and I think in my mind I remembered having that one. Anyway, that's a project for another day. I want to see if our cartridge works. In better news, the front metal strip of the ColecoVision is in really good shape. Never use alcohol to clean these, it will strip the graphics straight off. The top decal is also good, but the slot is dirty. I gave the slot contacts a quick clean off camera because I didn't want to undo all the hard work that we'd done on our cartridge PCB. Here we go. Deep breath. And this cartridge has been officially resurrected from the flames of my house fire. Now this is the part where I'll usually play the game for a while, but there was an issue. The control pad is absolutely terrible. I mean, they were terrible when they were new, but it's worse than ever. It only goes left and right if you push really, really hard. And the fire button only works about 30% of the time. Maybe I should refurbish this console in a future episode. And talking about future episodes, I've got a whole pile of similar cartridges, not just for the ColecoVision. Who'd be interested in seeing me restore some more of these? Maybe we could do them in different styles. I'm not even sure if any of these work. Let me know in the comments section below. Rescuing this cartridge has been a life-affirming experience for me. Sure, I lost all my belongings, but I gained the incredible support of some amazing people. And talking about amazing people, here are my amazing patrons appearing on the screen right now. My patrons 100% drive this channel, there's no question about it. Without them, I wouldn't be able to make this content. So I thank them from the bottom of my heart. If you're not a patron, maybe you consider coming along on the journey with me and helping fund this nonsense. You can go to www.patreon.com forward slash stuff for more details. Patrons get ad-free early access to all my videos, an exclusive Discord channel, exclusive videos, and also will obtain the ability to transform into a shark. That might not be true. Thanks for watching this far. Maybe you'd like to watch one of these other videos. Go on, you know you want to. Bye.